Yeah, thanks for coming along. Um, glad to be here. I extra put my shirt with a tie on, so um, I really wanted to look good fashion for you. So um, my talk is about OBS and the real cool stuff. Uh, I must say I'm quite biased because I really love OBS and what it's capable of. And uh, we as Copano, um, we were in a search of a new build system which is efficient and fulfills our requirements. And yeah, it was not hard to choose OBS in that regard. So um, smart, small agenda, so I want to show you what, who is Copano and what we're actually doing, uh, what our requirements were, um, what we did before, which is quite funny. Um, yeah, why we're using OBS, what is really awesome about it, and cool stuff you might not know. So I'm certain this is open source conference, right? So a lot of developers here, most likely Adrian is also sitting somewhere and many others. Um, I bet there are people here that know more about OBS than I do. Um, but it's, I think, quite a good insight. And I must add that there is one thing, you can call it a running gag, which I even encountered two days ago here at the conference, was like, guys, what about documentation? There's a big question mark behind it. So there's so much not really documented of OBS, which is very unfortunate, and also one of the reasons why, um, yeah, I try to find some ways in getting this better. Um, yeah, and it always starts with yourself, so I offered myself here for help as well, and I think this product really deserves it. You'll see it. So, yeah, we use um, OBS, what are our requirements? So essentially, we're now in the communication world uh, for, yeah, close over 10 years now. We're the only open source MAPI implementation in the world, and I'm talking real MAPI, so everything regarding MAPI attributes, the whole MAPI-based structure, um, all the MAPI attributes that you can literally set for an object, um, that's 100% in our solution. Um, our motto is, is like sharing and communication software for professionals. So yeah, everyone can set up a, a Dovecot and just have like a Thunderbird slap to it. But uh, traditionally, yeah, the more efficient you wanna get, the more features you need, as in calendaring and really professional calendaring with invites and with time zone uh, problems that you have to come over. And um, I'm saying this because Copano Core, or Copano in general, is, is just what Serafa used to be, um, at least for open source. So we had quite some closed source components beforehand, and now literally almost everything is open source now, completely under AGPL. And um, our business model is essentially, um, yeah, subscription based, just like SUSE, just like Red Hat, nothing special here. So we provide support, professional services, tested binaries, and extras. So, since we exist now for 10 years, um, all kinds of people have, yeah, specific requirements. I mean, it's very hard to go to, to an environment and say, yeah, you can only sell your product potentially to one platform. Of course, that would make life easier, right, if you just provide RPMs. But um, we have such a diverse, um, yeah, diverse customer base that we literally have to come up with all kinds of funny things from uh, Debian, of course, which is not funny, but really RHEL slash Ubuntu, everything, and even two special things, which is Colax and 1A. Just, just a question to the, to the audience. Does anyone know here what Colax is? So, does anyone know what Univention is? Okay, there's more. So, Univention and Colax have some similarities. So it's an own spin of your own type of distribution. The problem is, it is not comparable from a, from a spread perspective, yet we do have a good partnership with Colex. And this product in, in general, it's, it's not so bad, but it has its own, own archives, it has everything on its own. Uh, it's not using just like plain based on Debian uh, thing, so you have to do certain things to support that. And we also have one distributor in the Netherlands, actually a very good partner of ours. They, for whatever reason, don't ask me, uh, chosen uh, Slackware as a platform. So Slackware is like everything, put everything into tar GZs and just unpack them to the target and you're good. So that's like CME package management and of course you want to build something for that as well. Our goal was to find things that we can 
you know, that we don't have a build system that builds like for these platforms and these platforms and these platforms, we want to have a unified solution. So yeah, this sounds a little bit like bullshit bingo, but if you execute on this, you do quite a good job and you can deliver quite good on, on quality. So uh, continuous integration as in really that you have your, your development steps and your process well defined and well executed. Continuous delivery as in you deploy your software in such a way that when you yeah, provide a patch that it's uh, quite available instantly. One problem that we really had was 100% reproducible builds. And um, yeah, that ties in with the change root build environment and we want to have it scalable and fast because we seriously had scalability issues. So what did we have two years ago? And uh, just this list uh, is, doesn't look that long, but you can expect that it was heck a lot of work. Um, so yeah, indeed, we, we exist now for over 10 years, so we started with SVN. And our problem is, is that we also have parts that are built from Windows, and the only way how you can really yeah, control it really well is, is that you use SVN, or at that time, I mean. Uh, I mean, Git 10 years ago, think about it. Um, and then we had really manually created uh, change root environments. So essentially when a new release came out, when RHEL 7 popped out of the bottom, we just made like uh, an install. We got this change root and we executed everything in those change root builds. A little bit like the principle of what OBS actually does, but just in a static way. So we do it once, not with every build. Um, that was a heck of a lot of error prone. I mean, we're, we're talking that a developer knew, oh, I, I just updated gperf tools, for instance, uh, but he forgot one distribution, and so you got diverse, um, diverse results at the customer end. Of course, this is not something that you really don't want. Um, we didn't have any repositories. Yeah, we could have provided them as an extra, extra, extra step uh, behind our, all of our builds, but you know, in our delivery, we didn't have this continuous delivery mentality. So why making repositories if you don't deliver really as, as you would expect nowadays? Um, also, what was quite a problem was that we had entirely separated builds. That is, uh, we have a component called Archiver, for instance. So Archiver and Core share some libraries. And when these two components are built asynchronically because you, they're still separate products, but same library, uh, shared libraries. So when you, up, uh, when, you, when you say build this now, build Archiver, and you have a core which is not released in tandem, then you could get into issues regarding changes of those libraries. Of course, this is something that you want to prevent. Um, yeah, for every release we had a huge amount of manual labor that we had to do and a huge checklist as well and we had no OBS whatsoever. Also the problem regarding OBS is a little bit aside to it. Um, OBS loves SUSE, obviously. The problem is, is that in our company, there are like two people who really do suze stuff, nobody else. And that is quite a problem to, you know, sell people, this is awesome, you really gotta use it. And they say like, oh, it's, it's SUSE right now. Yeah. It's not that they say they don't like SUSE, but they never touched it really. So there was quite some work to do there. Um, so let's go through a little bit the requirements. Here's a little bit of an overview. I, I know it looks a little bit cluttered and a lot, but that's also the strength of Capano um, because it has this extreme modularity. We have customers with 50, 60,000 users running in parallel and uh, you can only make that happen by splitting up certain roles. So did you say that, uh, for instance, that the mail delivery from Spooler and DAgent are separate to different nodes, that you have your mobile devices uh, actually on a diff different endpoint web server? Because, I mean, when we're talking 50,000 users uh, concurrent, then you must know that 50,000 TCP sessions web server, you're getting a problem. So you need to have to have this ability of distribution. The good thing about this is, is that everything you can see here can also run on one node easily. I can mean this can even run on an ARM, uh, just a Raspberry Pi, fire it up and you're good. But the problem, but, but the idea is, is, is still that you have a lot of components and you have to have the relations to them, you have to have the, the, uh, the, the shared libraries working with each other and the binaries using them. 
So our requirement was we want to have something um, that does a lot for us, and in fact, uh, OBS does that by essentially having automatic requires, symbol visibilities, and uh, many other mechanisms where you can really just make sure that the, that the tags that you're using match to each other. So here we're good. Next thing was, um, we were primarily only on the 64-bit stream, we had 64 and 32-bit, obviously, so I-586 I and X686-64. Um, but our goal was also to yeah, be able, at least, at least for community reasons, to provide builds for other platforms as well. Here you can see Power8, here you can see ARM, you can see even Mainframe. And uh, this is actually just a snapshot that I made tonight. So yeah, not, not much happening tonight. Um, but in fact, we really need this power. So there are quite some good, um, quite some good workers there. So architectures, yes, no problem. The next thing was, we have a real communication stack. And this communication stack is defined also by sing single products. So for instance, we have a product called Archiver, and Archiver you don't necessarily need. It's just something that someone needs when he's archiving. So it's literally for us, it's like a separate product. We don't say you have to install Archiver, it's not a necessity to install this component, and that's why we provide separate repositories for these. And it also allows us to have a straightforward and independent release management, meaning a web app, for instance, is quite fast in development terms. So web app always get, receives uh, uh, quite fast updates, and core sometimes lacks a little bit behind in that regard. Um, so we are able like, to release web app independently from uh, core in a, in a quite good way, and we wanted to have this like, in a, in a product-based scheme. Um, because our team is quite distributed, you could compare it if you take the SUSE terminology like uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server and uh, High Availability Extension. They are also released in tandems, but the updates are separately released. So that was also quite good. Now we come to the special requirements. Um, Colex and Slackware. Believe me, that was quite a nightmare uh, in the beginning, but in the end it was like awesome. <laughs> um, then we used the whole Atlassian stack. So Atlassian uh, is, I mean, they have great products. We use Jira, we use Confluence, we use Stash, which is now uh, called Bitbucket. Um, and we wanted to integrate it in a, in a most sane way. So continuous delivery and or continuous integration is defined by the fact that when you commit something, you instantly want to know what's the result. So our code base, just to give you an idea, just core, nothing else, is 600,000 lines of code of all kinds of C++ and Python. So it is the, the, the effects that a single commit can have and um, can, can be drastic, depending on, of course, what you touch. Um, then we have also, um, not yet, but we're working on that at the moment, the, the requirement to say we want to build images and we don't want to use like every distribution's independent tool set for that. So we're talking here clearly Kiwi, which is perfectly integrated into OBS. Um, also, uh, the underscore service file, which helps you a lot in versioning, so you don't have to do everything yourself, like version tagging and so on. You have one place to do that, and that's in your Git repo, nowhere else. Um, one of the core requirements also was to be really, 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 really fast. So just to give you an idea, we had uh, beforehand like builds that were taking hours, and now we got them down to, in the worst case scenario of 10 minutes. Um, ah maybe 12, 13, but that's really the worst case. So normally we, we can make it uh, within 500 seconds. Um, yeah, and do QA, that really matters. So we needed to build up a, a quite new chain. Also that helps us, of course, uh, not to do everything in manual labor. There's, in communication software, it's quite hard to do everything automated because you have so many potential issues. So the checklist is still, still exists and you need to have it. And uh, that's, that's our model, essentially, so that's, that's what you're paying a subscription for. So now I think I bored you a lot with, with stuff, so I want to show you a little bit how that worked out. So here on the right-hand side, you can see the commit that was necessary to be done in OBS um, that allows you, essentially, to pick up the build collapse file, which we had here. So 
it's nothing super special. It's available in, in 2.7. But the awesome thing is, is that you literally just have sort of a bash script which just executes it. Think of it, a own type of spec file. You, we could have, you know, developed sort of like a compatibility to spec or, uh, or a Debian file. Um, but it was simply not necessary. So the only thing that we needed to do is, is essentially look for the build colex file and you can build for that. The cool thing about that is not only colex, you can do all kinds of funny things with OBS. So in the end, just a one-liner with actually adding something uh, to be listened to and you can go for your whole description set on how to build for that platform. Very straightforward, nothing special to do. So what do you gotta do? You make a binary import, here's the link. By the way, I think documentation, this can be done a bit better. Um, thinking of a little bit documenting it also from our side uh, way better. But um, it's, it's helpful, so you'll find your way, I, I bet. And make your local uh, build collects file. I gave you a real world example directly on paste open SUSE org, which you can just fetch and yeah, use it. Um, yeah, change it to your needs, of course, if you don't want to build Copano. Yeah, the next thing was Slackware. Um, that is, um, to be honest, quite a bitch. The problem is, is that uh, Slackware does everything in TarGZ. They don't know anything else but that. So what they do is, is essentially they, they um, fetch a tar, they compile it, they retar it, the result of course, and they use literally, yeah, this tar file as the binaries, and these binaries are executed to that, uh, or e unpacked on that uh, target system. Um, in general, not that complicated. Um, so OBS is capable of doing so. The only thing why we didn't do it is for two reasons, or three reasons actually. Um, one reason was we haven't, we, we checked forums, we haven't seen one request doing Slackware. So we thought might not interesting for upstream. Second thing was um, that we've essentially hijacked the functionality of Arch Linux in that regard. So in OBS, you have the awesome possibility of just selecting the repositories or just pointing to them on, on uh, BOO. And therefore, when we you know, hurt Arch just to get the stuff done what we want to, because we simply don't need Arch, at least not yet, and therefore we just hijacked it. So the patches that are required for that is, are also here. Um, if you think you have a better idea on how to integrate it or make like a separate target like a build collex, go for it. That's why I wanted to share this. Um, yeah, so the, the binary import is literally the same as with collex, just with the difference, really just take the tar GZ files. Because the patch sets also realize, ah, okay, I gotta unpack them directly with tar, and I then in the end take the results, repack them, and that's the whole workflow behind it. So it's quite simple. Um, and here below you also have a link uh, which you can just simply use. With this link you have a description, but you can just take one by one what Arch does. So we didn't have like this format uh, thing. With Colex it was quite natural because they have sort of a special packaging mechanism. Just taking DPKG for instance wouldn't work for them. Uh, so therefore we decided here we can just hijack it from this other distribution. This is quite uh, awesome. Um, to integrate with Stash or Bitbucket or any name of, um, of whatever code management service that you have. So you can also integrate it with Subversion, we even had that, like a post commit hook. Um, so when you really want to make sure that every build that you're building, no matter in what branch, no matter in what area, you can just create a so-called post receive hook in Stash. Sorry, Bitbucket, it's called now. Um, so essentially, what you need to do is, is just set up a curl. I have here dash dash insecure if you have a self-signed uh, SSL certificate. You're setting up a post, and you're using a token. And this token has to be created for further hand. So this token is really awesome because you don't have to have username, passwords, and share them all through around. Of course, you can use that as well. So just in the URL, you could you, you replace it by that. But if you want to have something like services doing your job, then you don't want to, yeah, tinker around with all kinds of uh, uh, usernames and password combinations. So therefore, this token is, is quite efficient. This is like OSC service RR, which is remote run. And essentially, that's what's happening. So you're committing something, Stash has a post receive hook, sends it back, and then OBS rebuilds automatically. Um, the good thing about that is, is you really, um, 
Yeah, that, that's like the first, first step of continuous integration. So every build that you're doing, you have your first step. Everything that is done, I have a build for it. Then the next step for us is Jenkins. So in our opinion, you cannot, I mean, we used Jenkins beforehand, by the way. So we had change routes, static change routes. We inserted all the builds there. So the source code that we made was uh, like packed, was sent to one of the nodes, then it was unpacked, uh, compiled, results we got, and UPIA. So Jenkins is very powerful, but it lacks certain areas, like the scalability. Yes, you can add worker nodes to it as well. Um, but it's not, not really the same like OBS, because you have to set up all your sources, everything. You have, you have to manually set up every distribution for your own, and that's just, in, in our opinion, was stupid. So in the end, um, integrating with Jenkins was for us the next step. So we have code, we have uh, the builds, but what happens next? And what happens next is, is that we just wanted to make sure that, for instance, um, um, uh, unit tests and um, in, in the beginning unit tests, I'm, I'm coming to that later, and uh, Selenium for instance, because we also have web app, a lot of JavaScript there. Um, so we wanted to have sort of a hook, or we were looking for sort of a hook which can, when you have published builds, successfully built, that they take the next step. So that's step three essentially. In Jenkins you create your job, you create a build token there that's built in, nothing special to do, you can just, just search for a token there in, in a job uh, which you want to create. Um, and then in userlib obs server bs config, just add this line for all the repos that you have. So it's literally just an array, so you can add as many as you want to. That's just an example here. And you can create your reference job. Of course, you can make that parameterized, I mean, developers can do whatever they want to, but this is just an example to say, hey, in the end, I'm just doing a curl request, and this curl request is sent to Jenkins. So we've been tinkering around, around quite a lot of time because we were thinking like, yeah, you can just monitor the o, uh, OBS build, right? So you can just OSCR, see what's going on, and just wait, but that's like more polling principle, and we don't like polling. We think an event is, is way more efficient and uh, doesn't use that many resources and just makes things also less error prone. So that was the way how we did it. Um, yeah, next thing, what do you do when you have everything in your Jenkins which you can trigger all sorts of tests on? You also wanna make sure that you have images. So the cool thing is, um, it's a no-brainer actually. You can just take like the standard .kiwi files that are in, in the GitHub repository which you can see here. So there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of standard templates that you can use for RHEL and for OpenSUSE. Um, and they are, yeah, you sometimes have to change, when you have your own private instance, you have to change the URLs because they just point to OBS repositories. But if you, in fact, have multiple times like the same product, then you don't want to use it like that way. You just want to specify a certain project or a certain um, package in a project. And therefore, it makes sense to, to specifically look at the repositories area in, in your Kiwi XML. Um, I just learned here at the conference, actually, that uh, Jan Blunk, um, who was busy with uh, live build and OBS integration, which is super awesome because we've been looking for that. Um, so this is one of our next things that is on the list to really make also Debian and Ubuntu images. And therefore, you have all major players, right? So um, that's, that helps us, of course, to transport the product that we have in an easy, sane way. Because Kiwi gives you a lot of possibilities also to integrate like logic in terms of configs that you want to deploy. Uh, for instance, using Copano with a standard MySQL isn't, yeah, it works, but it's not super, a good idea because you have many ways to improve performance just by adding two or three parameters and you have like magnitudes of better performance without any uh, any danger data endangerment. So the next thing was obviously uh, for the uh, trigger to run, you should use service files. And uh, I must say, from what I see also on on BOO, I'm quite astonished that service is not really used that much, though it's such a great architecture. Um, so it's pluggable, literally. You have all these uh, tar, uh, like tar SCM and uh, recompress. You have all these um, uh, service projects in GitHub, 
which are really great, and you can just add a service name one after another by a block. And here you can see a real example, except for a username and password. Um, here you can see really everything that we're doing, so we get a master revision for every build that we're doing. Of course, we're not releasing master directly to the public as a release, so we have other jobs where it's like uh, tagged specifically, where we set like the, the correct tag that should be checked out. Um, and of course, recompressing it, uh, use XZ for size and set version, which is, by the way, really awesome. Um, also, the changes that I showed you um, regarding 1A and Colax, they also can support set version, which is really good because it just gets like the version numbering that you have from your uh, source code management tool, and it just sets that dy dynamically for your DSC file, spec file, build Colax file, whatever you have. The next thing was, that's a little bit the convincing part, where like, yeah, OSC, OSC, that's OpenSUSE commander. And um, not saying that that's in our company we don't like OpenSUSE or that there's anyone who, who, who doesn't like it, um, but they simply don't know. And the first thing was like, yeah, what is OSC? I don't know it, I haven't touched it. And um, the excuse was, yeah, that's OpenSUSE, right? I don't have that in Debian. So there's no excuses, essentially. And I have to apologize, this is a Windows laptop here. So I, um, because we're in communication world and communication world Outlook is also a deal. So there you go. Um, but you can easily get OSC even to run on Windows with Sigwin. Um, the only thing what, what I recommend you to do is just really follow this how-to because um, the native installed uh, Python that you have with uh, Sigwin, at the moment at least, um, is without SSL support. So the curl, uh, PyCurl there is without SSL support and that's obviously not a good idea. Um, yeah, so with these instructions you can get started. Um, yeah. Be fast, very, very fast. So I, I mentioned when you do builds for every commit and you have a lot of developers, then you want to make sure that your builds are fast. The cool thing about that and really awesome point is you can kill everything in OBS with hardware. So it's slow and you have a lot of builds, you have a lot of distributions, you've seen the list that we had beforehand. Um, then you must know every distribution, every architecture, means rebuild from scratch. Rebuild the full operate or reinstall the full operating system. Uh, put your uh, artifacts in there, compile it, get the build results, push them. And that for every distribution. So every commit that is issued at Copano generates 25 from scratch compilations of 600,000 lines of code. You need hardware for that. So one of the things that we actually did um, was really to build everything in uh, TempFS that works quite well. Uh, the only thing, what we also realized, because uh, Sarafa and Copano, we are uh, also involved in the Iridium project, that's a spin-off of the Chromium uh, browser, uh, which is just very secure, um, but we're talking here huge source code, and there this size doesn't, isn't enough anymore, so 64 gigabytes, or 60 gigabytes is not enough there anymore. But for us, of, of course, that's also cool. And you can tune it, actually, because every worker has like when you have a system, let's say 16 cores, you could say, ah, let's take eight workers running there. And uh, that means at full load, literally every job would have full two CPUs available. And uh, you can size by, you can see how much size you're using literally because it's just like uh, checking out your DF output on how much is really used at the time. And then you can tune it and see how much TempFS you actually really need because you don't really need it all the time. But of course, you're installing the full distro in there and therefore you need some size. Also, um, since we have some, some separated uh, worker nodes, so they're not all at one location, uh, really use OBS cache here and cache size. It really helps specifically for not like super bandwidth locations. Um, so that is really, really good. And, and the footprinting and the checksumming, it, we never have issues with that. So uh, really recommend to do that. And what we also did is, is um, we did some benchmarks regarding like over committing. So to give you back the idea, um, we had like uh, these 10 nodes, I think. Every node has uh, with us, I think, these 16 cores. And we have eight 
workers on there, so potentially thinking two CPUs for each and every. So you would say, yeah, make, make J2 or so, and then you have a full load. But that's quite stupid, um, because when you say like that you only have one or two single uh, rebuilds, that you say a developer is just you know, checking something out for a specific platform, just want to see the current log of it, and he can make uh, a specific targeted rebuild for only one distribution. And then that node would just utilize two CPUs, even though it would be available potentially on, where, on which node it is distributed. Therefore, um, just make them full. Make, uh, make J um, with all the worker CPU cans that you have brought. And uh, yeah, just let them fight for CPU cycles. In the end, the benchmarks look very good. So you, in, in total, you win. Yeah, do QA that matters. So. Um, we had uh, the thing regarding unit tests, so we have quite an amount of it because MAPI is a very complicated uh, um, description of technology, let's call it that. So MAPI uh, with time zone issues, with all kinds of MAPI properties, with all kinds of operations like deleting, moving, um, it, is, it is necessary absolutely that you have unit tests for a product like that. Therefore, um, our idea is, is to make like the make test happen on OBS workers as well, because that scales super well. And also, with these tests, you also take all the components and all the dependencies of that certain distribution into account. So beforehand, we did like, yeah, one, one node or one Jenkins job, do the unit tests in there, and it was Debian-based, or it is Debian-based actually, still. And uh, then you fire it off, and then you know, yeah, my unit tests are working on Debian, but you don't know if they're working on SUSE, you don't know if they're working on Red Hat, that's, that's just, doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, our, the example that I already brought to integrate with a published hook, that is really, really the best. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so awesome, because you can really make sure that you're not missing out on any commit, and you get the results for every commit. Of course, you have to hit it by hardware, but in the end, if quality gains from that, and actually developers also learn from that, because in the beginning we had also issues where like, there were like 10, 20 commits in the meanwhile happening, and um, then we're thinking like, hey, damn it, we touched that three times, which commit is it now, which is fucking up literally the, the, the test. Um, so the point is, if you have that for every build, you are increasing quality and your developers are also learning from it because they really pinpoint and you're saving time in the end also. And uh, yeah, so Kiwi is also what is very, very much not perceived really well is we had also with this whole Serafa and Copano thing where we essentially all the services are now Copano named, um, we had the issue with, you know, upgrading and, um, you know, having dependency issues from package to package to package. So uh, <laughs> what we had was essentially, uh, we installed like 80% everything correct in the beginning, and then we realized, oh damn it, there are like two or three older packages actually, um, but they are not included really well, and they ask for dependencies, because we also sort of have to have manual references or manual requires in a, in a spec files. So Kiwi is a perfect automation tool for all your installations. So if you want to install something and you define like just your target, we have a meta package called Copano Server Packages. If you just want to install that and you know that your build is running, then you know you have no dependency issues because it's installing. So therefore, no install issues whatsoever. Of course, you can take it forward that you say, what is with the next version? If you change like a library to be contained in a different package, then you have to think of, Hmm, um, then I have to have upgrade tests as well. Coming to that later. So yeah, OpenQA is there and it is really great. We really took our time to look at it, but for us it is really like this um, making a screenshot, comparing a screenshot with another. It works in many cases, but not the ones that are important for us at least. Um, so the, we actually evaluate our test output and this output uh, is for us quite important. So we make a little bit of magic around that, and uh, we just rate that for us at least way more efficient. Not saying that OpenQA is bad, really, I don't want to say that, but for us it was not a perfect match. Um, so do platform-related tests is also a very, very good and important thing. Um, we also, Jenkins, uh, thought like, yeah, let's just do the unit tests initially, as I mentioned. 
And uh, one of the facts that were left behind is also PHP, because PHP also different major versions. And with this broad number of all kinds of distributions, you have to make sure that the unit tests also run on every platform. So everything that is depending or platform related um, is something that OBS can entirely make, make work for you. And also, which is quite nice, the published hook, which I uh, already mentioned that I love it, it also works for everything that is Kiwi related. So to get the full chain, developer, commit something. When a developer commits something, OBS automatically picks it up because we have this hook that the build system OBS starts. OBS uses underscore service files to automatically grab it from the source, uh, from the SCM, from our Git, and automatically deploys it on a worker, rebuilds it. When it's rebuilt, it automatically tells Jenkins, hey guy, you have something to do. In parallel, it also tells OBS, by the way, I have a new package for this, and I want to have an image of it. So Jenkins is one bulk part where we put all the other, um, all the other QA jobs into it. Ah, here I go. Um, here we have everything that is uh, regarding non-OBS QA related jobs, and there are some. For instance, we use Valgrind also. And Valgrind running on a non-realistic system that you pull, that you're really footprinting or so that just simply doesn't make any sense. So therefore, you have this full chain, developer, commit something, OBS takes on it. Jenkins is notified, hey, we have, we have something new. Jenkins is also, by the way, uh, the guy who takes care of all the translations, right? So when somebody translates something, we have a job that, that just recurringly picks up all the translations, puts them into a big bit bucket back in a separate branch, and the developer can just merge it. So in the end, here with uh, Jenkins taking, taking next steps, we have this non-OBS QA jobs, um, which simply don't make sense doing them in, in OBS. Then we have like the manual part, where we say, hey, there's some sort of uh, uh, QA that, that comes behind. Here, to be honest, we cannot do it for every commit, of, of obviously, but already this chain of our unit tests, for instance, being executed in line with every build, that's already a big relief. Yeah, and if QA is not happy, here you can see like this not happy software tester. He is upset because of your code. It's below if you cannot read it. Yeah, so that's, that's the whole chain that we established. Um, yeah, I think. Great. Um, if you want to know what Copano is all about, just out of curiosity, I have tomorrow a workshop, three hours where you can really see a full setup from scratch. If you take a laptop with you, virtual box, whatever. Uh, we, can, we can set it up together and you would have a real full communication stack which communicates with your mobile phones and Outlook and so on. Yeah, I think that quite shows how we use OBS. Questions? Nope. All right, I'm still hanging around, so if there's anything that you want to come up with, just approach me. Thanks.